question? Yes. Um, I'm wondering if the, um, when you said the, uh, the 7,000 years ago, the old stuff, I'm wondering how much that is actually based on uh, Egyptian mythology about the gods. Yes, thank you for asking that question. If you couldn't hear the question, uh, the question is, in the Book of Them, the ancient Egyptian story, how much of that is based on actual Egyptian mythology? So uh, the, um, the Egyptians uh, apparently, to the best of what researchers say, uh, their knowledge of their collective history was so widespread that certain of their stories they didn't write down, or at least we don't have surviving copies. So Plutarch, a Roman, wrote the what you could call the Passion of Osiris, uh, which includes the, the lamentations of Isis and the contendings of Set and Horus. So that mega story, his record we have, and I spoke with some Egyptologists, including Martin Bernal, author of Black Athena. I said, how, how much is this a credible, authentic rendering of the Egyptian story, or is it a Romanized version? He said, to the best of his knowledge, it was, he regarded it as authentic. So if you read Plutarch's version, which you can get for free in the Wallace Budge book, I think it's, it's not Gods of the Egyptians, but it's, maybe it's the God, Egyptian mythology, I think is what it's called, but you can find it online. And I, I, I recommend it, because it's kind of like, you know, when you know what I'm riffing on, then you'll, you'll see like, oh, okay, so he's taking the same story, but he's showing the deleted scenes, as it were. Yes? One thing that always interests me is how people, creators find courage in their creative processes. So what is it as a creator, be it subject matter or all, in the thick of it, that scares you, and how do you build a bridge and get over it? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, in case you couldn't hear, it's about the question from this uh, lady is about uh, courage and how do you find the courage to write, uh, to get through the stuff that scares you. And the students at Clarion know that they were challenged by their instructor last week to find the fear. And this is something that I recommend writing students to find the fear. Whatever you're afraid of is a source of great drama, so you need to address it. And I guess what happens is that you know, if you look at these things that scare you long enough, eventually this is kind of like uh, it's like a version therapy, you know, or counter reversion therapy, where you know you're terrified of tarantulas, so they first bring the tarantula in a little cage <laughs> in the room at the opposite side of the room, yeah. and then eventually you're holding the tarantula and you're kissing the little tarantula. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that's what it is with all these things that 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 horrify us, and you know some are are so horrible that you know you never get that close, but at least they can be in the room with you. So I think that's what it is. You you look at the things that disturb you and bother you including if it's just the fear that you're a, another hack and a failure and you'll never write again. <laughs> and you just, you just face it and you, you look at it long enough and you say like, okay, well, it's, just, it's a fantasy. It's just in my head and what I do is up to me. But I'm sure you've never had that. Oh, yeah. I'm Mr. Coward. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I'm, I mean, most writers I know you face that kind of fear on a fairly regular basis. You know, a few don't. Uh, they're, they're mostly raging alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Well, of course, the, the students and the many students who are right here are, um, they are writing stories. In fact, actually, the students, uh, they are writing stories of their own. And so we have critique sessions and they're producing some excellent work on standing stuff. And some of the stuff that I'm going over includes, you know, strategies for dealing with novels, but also strategies for character building and, and, and plot. And just to share one thing for those of you, I'm sure, how many of you are writers in the crowd? I'm sure it's virtually everybody. Else. So one of the things that I've been advising people to do, people often say, you know, I don't have any ideas, or I don't have enough ideas, I don't have enough ideas to fill a book. So I encourage people to use their horde of rants and raves. So whatever, I mean, if they're online, you know, on Facebook, they've recently been saying, you know, probably every day, I can't believe those, and wow, they're such a great, you just take all those, and that's the stuff that you really care about a lot right now. You're passionate about it right now. You've got so much to say, and you're giving it away for free on Facebook. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you collect that stuff, you think what you really care about, and then that's, so that's one of my recommendations to people. When people think they don't have ideas, I say, no, of course you've got ideas. You've got wall-to-wall -wall ideas. Yes, ma'am. Why are you the Mr. Flock? When the planet Krypton was about to explode. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the, the, the the correct answer to that to your question is uh, is really quite boring. Uh, it's you know the fact is I, I needed a pseudonym uh, back years ago when I wrote for an underground newspaper in high school, and then when I formed a hip hop group, and then when I went into community radio, and the name kind of evolved and it became that. 
the actual real reasons for it are, uh, are you know, beyond that, like why those words are, are, are tortured and, and wrapped up in, you know, youth craziness and self, you know, blah, blah, blah. So really, that's, if you thought what I just said was boring, if I told you the real story, it would be, you'd be out. Okay? <laughs> mystique, a little mystique is, is good, and for all the people who said, ah, the name Minister, ah, how, 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 how pretentious, I can't believe it's gone. I don't want them reading my book anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the other people say, whoa, that's interesting, I don't want to read this. And, uh, you know, some of you know the TV series The Wire. Okay, so I'm working on a book on The Wire, and I've got a chance to interview about 14, 15 people involved with making the series, including David Simon, who's the creator, executive producer. And uh, so I passed, uh, I interviewed one of the writers, David Mills, late David Mills, and I, I you know, he, I made a good impression on him. I said, you know, can you help me interview David Simon? And he said, okay, I'll pass a note for you. And so I, so Mills sent back the note that he got. And the note said, from David Simon, I will talk to anybody named Faust. <laughs> there will be Coyote King's Book 2, Uranium City. So, uh, so I'm having a lot of fun trying to imagine what that book will be about, and I have to start <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm very delighted. There were a lot of people who, who, who really responded well to Coyote King's, and so, uh, you know, when the book ended, they were driving a little bit south, but they were gonna start driving east. So uh, they start in Alberta, and the next stop is the real Uranium City in Saskatchewan, oh. where some very bad things have been happening. <laughs> so uh, hopefully that will be full of drops. And what fun. Yeah. To write? Um, enemies lists. So like what has been easy to write? Yeah. Um, okay, so The Coyote Kings uh, uh, was, uh, I wrote it as a screenplay in 1995. I intended it in my youthful absurdity to be an independent film, which obviously I would direct and star in. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I learned, uh, you know, quickly that I was a genius at not making a film. I mean, you've never seen a film not get made as well as I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, so I, uh, but, when I decided to turn that into a, a novel, uh, I was in my first year of teaching, and I had, let me see, I had three, in three months, while I was working and doing a bunch of other stuff, I managed to get the first two-fifths of the screenplay done, and then in July, in the first week of August, I got the rest done. And it was just, bam, and I was up late nights, and I was just like a madman, but it was wonderful. I mean, and having a screenplay to work from meant that on my best days, I think I was doing like, um, I think my top day was 30 pages. Mm, wow. So, you know, now, you know, memory memory distorts, I mean, it was two pages, but uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure there was one 30 page day. But, uh, you know, that that's unusual. But I couldn't do that if it were not based on, you know, an existing thing. So, uh, so yeah, that was, so, you know, I've recommended to some of the students, you know, consider writing your story, your novel first as a screenplay and then adapting it yourself. Because the, 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 when your story is done, you know you've got an ending and people already like it, 
you're relaxed. You're not saying to yourself, I can never do this, because you've already done it. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I mean, my students are already, these students are already laughing at my tortured metaphors in class, and absurd, it's like, sure, let's tack another idea onto that same metaphor and watch it just sag and snap. But it's like, you know, it's like, your second relationship, your second love is, is you know, at least you, you know, you know, you know how to behave. You know where things are. <laughs> In the city, that's what I mean, you know. <laughs> Restaurants and stuff. <laughs> Did it change a lot between screenplay and novel? Yes, and it was, it was really fun to do that because, you know, the screen, screen, pardon me, the screenplay very, you know, narrow and focused and it's all, it's all visual and, and auditory. And so now I got to do these asides that you know I enjoyed uh, into people's heads and make, you know make discoveries. I and the way I, you know I mentioned it to the class, to me it was like adding deleted scenes. You know, it was like creating them and saying, okay, ah, so that's what he did between this and that. And you know, one of my favorite things to do was a writer. Uh, and Thomas Harris, some of you may know um, Red Dragon, the book of Red Dragon. So I had, and Sons of the Lambs. And one of the reasons I adore Red Dragon as the original film Manhunter and also as the book is that it's just a classic at taking somebody who's utterly despicable and showing that there's nothing excusable about his crimes, but I can actually feel horrible for what happened to him to make him into a monster. And so that's what I try to do with my fiction. And I really enjoyed in Coyote Kings taking, you know, some some bad guys and saying, you know, what's what makes them tick? And you know, some of them have less excuse than others. But it was, you know, it was really enjoyable to get into those, those crawl into those brains. I, I don't often use that sentence, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. we're getting the, the, the cut off. So the video now. We're going to close the pills. So anyway, thanks for coming out. Really appreciate it. Thank you.